Hi everyone, and welcome to this talk on ways towards a YAML-less Cloud Native DevEx. I'm happy to speak here at the Cloud Native Virtual Summit featuring Kubernetes. This is definitely my first remote talk, so bear with me. So right, this is me. I'm Leander. I'm a chief software architect working for Kuabe GmbH in Munich. Well, not at the moment. At the moment, I'm in the home office here in the beautiful town of Rosenheim. This is day five in the home office. Right, so what is this talk all about? Cloud Native DevEx today. Well, DevEx, the acronym for Developer Experience. And I'm sure you know all this conveyor belt thing here, right? This is how we de deliver software today. We frequently deliver software maybe on a two-week sprint basis. We design, we, de we develop, we test, we integrate, we deploy, and finally, in a fully DevOps mode, we operate the stuff we just built. Now, unfortunately, I think this conveyor belt is not as streamlined as it looks here. I think cloud native developer experience looks much more like this today. Well, we have all this agile stuff. Um, we need to cope with Docker, non-functional requirements. We have to write loads of YAML. Um, we have our CI CD pipeline we have to take care for. We have Kubernetes. Um, even more YAML, and if there's not more YAML, then it's um, for sure it's JSON we have to write. Um, maybe AWS, we have to care for all those metrics and the tracing and the logging and a lot of other techno technological stuff um, which we have to cope with. Now, one thing I'm really concerned now at the moment is how do you organize and enable your technology teams for fast flow and high productivity? And I found a good book about this. Um, so make sure you read this book here, Team Topologies. And what they write here is that too much cognitive load will quickly become a bottleneck when you want fast flow and high productivity. Now they divide this cognitive load in three areas. The first one is the intrinsic cognitive load. Well, and that's basically the cognitive load related to the fundamental aspects and the knowledge in the problem space. Now we are all software engineers and our intrinsic cognitive load is, well, we have to know the used languages and the APIs we program against, uh, maybe those micro architecture things like how do we name classes, or how do we name the packages, how we structure our microservices. So we have this sort of intrinsic cognitive load, well, per default. The next thing is we have our extraneous cognitive load and this is all the stuff we have to do that relates to the environment. Right? We have to know how to deploy our microservices. We have to know how to configure those microservices. We have to know a lot of console commands and all those you know, tooling aspects. And the third cognitive load is the so-called domain cognitive load. And this stuff relates to the specific aspects of the dis business domain. Now, I call this the value-added thinking and learning. This is where we actually produce value for our customers. Now the question is, what do we do with intrinsic cognitive load and extraneous cognitive load so we have um, enough of this good germane cognitive load? And the first answer is, well, try to minimize the intrinsic cognitive load, right? And you can do this by training and peer programming. Maybe you introduce a few standards in your in your project. Uh, maybe you reduce like the used languages to a you know sane minimum. Um, now we will not talk about the intrinsic cognitive load too much today. The thing I want to talk to you about today is how can you eliminate the extraneous cognitive load, okay? Because this is all the environment specific stuff. And key to eliminating this extraneous cognitive load is basically automation. You have to automate and you have to automate and then you standardize a bit and then you automate and automate uh, once again. Now when it comes to automation, well, it's all about the tools you use and you have to use the right tools for the job. And there are quite a few interesting tools out there in the cloud native universe, which I want to introduce you today. Namely, it's draft, build packs, customize, scaffold and tilt. The first two draft and build packs, they kind of focus on how do we build our uh, cloud native workloads pretty quickly. Customize is a way to, well, reduce YAML bloat and uh, kind of get rid of those um, redundant definitions. 
and scaffold and tilt are both two tools that continuously or that enable us for continuous development, right? So we stick in our IDE, um, we code along, uh, we implement features, and both of those tools, they make sure that, you know, uh, once they detect changes, it's rolled out um, straight to the environment. Okay. Now enough talking, enough slides. Uh, if you want to follow along, um, then make sure to check out this GitHub repository here. So it's github.com, Elrima, which is my, my private one, and the repo is called Productive Cloud Native DevEx. And I put uh, quite a bit of code there, plus instructions how to use those tools, okay? And I basically guide you through this, um, through this repo and all the demos now. Okay, let's have a look at the first one. Well, the first one is called Draft. They um, say to themselves, it's streamlined Kubernetes development. Uh, you find Draft at this URL here, draft.sh. And what they say is they target the inner loop of the developer's workflow. So as you hack and code, but before code is committed to version control. So Draft um, aims to make us more productive during our daily development. Well, it's developed and backed by Microsoft Azure. And well, basically you have two simple commands, draft create and draft up. Um, they provide uh, quite a few languages. You know, they have uh, eight languages at the moment, .NET, Go, Node, PHP, Java, uh, Python, and Ruby. And the good thing is that if you say draft create, they detect the languages used uh, within the project, and then they generate a Docker file with same defaults for that language, and they also create a Helm chart for it. Okay, well, let's have a quick look at Draft then. So let's go here. Um, you see here I have a um, very small um, Go project. Well, it's a Go module. Uh, if we have a quick look at the main Go, well, you know, this is like the most sim simplistic uh, Go microservice you can imagine. Now let's say draft create. Not much happened here, but you see that it says draft detected Go ready to sail. All right, so let's have a look at the um, at what it created. And you see here, suddenly there's a Docker file and there is a charts directory and a draft tunnel. So you see, this stuff here has been generated automatically. Now, they base it from the Golang image, they expose a few ports, um, they copy in our sources, then they do the uh, Go compile and Go install, um, and then they run it. Here in the charts directory, what you see is, well, basically created a template file um, and the, the, uh, the Helm chart for our small microservice. And the draft toml is basically to, well, to configure the environment. Now draft is really basic. Um, the thing is the Helm chart is a Helm 2 chart at the moment. Well, you know, no Helm 3 support at the moment. And well, the generated Docker file, it definitely needs some, needs some fine tuning, but to quickly get you up and running, you know, draft does a, well, reasonably good job. So if we want to kickstart things uh, quickly, then uh, make sure you have a look at draft. All right. Now let's have a look at cloud native build packs. And I think they're even more superior. Well, the concept of build packs it, is not really new, right? Um, it's been introduced by Heroku in uh, 2011. And since then, it's been adopted by, you know, several uh, platform as a service products like Cloud Foundry and, and you know, OpenShift maybe. Um, so in 2018, Pivotal and Heroku, they, they coined and initiated this uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation project called Cloud Native Build Packs. So what are those? Well, Build Packs are a pluggable and modular tool to translate source code into OCI images. Okay, so all you need is, well, you need a Git repository or some source code 
and you give it to cloud native build packs and runs a few commands and the cloud native build pack will then kind of take care of uh, transforming this source code into a runnable docker image it will detect the language it will compile or interpret or whatever steps are necessary it will package the final binary into a a runtime image right so you have your um, your application, you have uh, a so-called builder image, um, then you kind of issue the build command and what you will get is a, um, a final run image with your application inside and you know a few uh, build pack provided layers. So this kind of reduces the operational burden on, on us developers and also imagine you know cloud native build packs on your uh, CI environments. So this makes it really easy to transform source code into something runnable. Also, it supports like the enterprise operators who want to manage like applications at scale because it's possible to kind of rebase um, the run image used. So imagine you, you, you base on, I don't know, Tomcat some specific version as the run image. Now there's an important security fix and with the rebase command, it's uh, possible really easy to kind of base your application onto a newer runtime image without having to recompile all the, um, all the application and rebuild all the application. So that's kind of neat. Uh, there are several uh, default build packs and uh, of course there's the option to build custom packs um, for any for any specific stuff right so let's have a quick look at the at the cloud native build packs demo okay so um, I urge you have a look at the the official build build pack samples git repository okay so um, clone this repository and then we go inside uh, this repository uh, what you see here is the actual build command okay so what you need is the pack CLI so on macOS you probably install it using brew and on Linux you, you just download the binary so you have this pack binary and you say pack build minus P specifies the project minus minus builder specifies the builder image used to well create the final artifact and then you give it a name so let's copy this and we go in here you see there's a java maven uh, uh, example there's a kotlin gradle example and a ruby example so let's build the Kotlin one. So we say pack build minus p Kotlin Gradle, which is the directory. We specify um, the builder image and off we go. Now let's see what's happening now. Well, it's checking that I have the final builder image. It's all up to date. Now it's going through the detection phase. It does detect that we need the Kotlin Gradle. It's analyzing it. Um, it's restoring any state, you know, from previous builds because, you know, for a um, Kotlin Gradle project, well, we need a JDK to compile everything and we also need Gradle um, to, to, um, to build the project. Then it's building the project using Gradle. This is what you see here during the builder phase. And then it's exporting everything. And, well, finally, we have a um, running Kotlin uh, Gradle application docker image so if we want to run this just to show you that this is working off we go and you see um, this spring application written in Kotlin um, spins up nicely uh, we have the uh, final run image right well for a Java project using Maven it's as simple. We just go in here, we do that, we issue the command again, pack build minus p, specify the name and the builder image, and the same thing happens now again, only that it now detects, well, I need a JDK, I need Maven. The Maven build is running, a Maven clean install, everything's done, and off you go, okay? And using cloud native build packs, you don't even need a JDK locally on your machine. You don't need Maven on your local machine. All you need is the source code, give the source code to cloud native build packs and uh, the rest is cared for in the builder image. 
Now, of course, for, you know, specific stuff like, you know, our simple Golang microservice like we had before, again, see here, this is um, the same microservice as we had before. Well, so all we say this time, well, this time we use a different builder image. We do that. And same thing here. Well, you see, I have not built that one yet. So it pulled a few updates. Downloaded a new base image. Off we go. Detect it. We need a Go compiler and Go mod. Um, now it's downloading Go because this has been the first build, right? So it's using the correct Go compiler. Now it's starting and running Go install to transform um, the Go source code into the final binary. And once that's done, it will again build the final runtime image. Okay, as simple as that, right? So really easy, and I think Cloud Native Build Packs has a bright future. That, that it works totally nicely and uh, is really simple to use. All right, the next tool I want to talk about is Customize. And I'm sure you heard about this. Now, you always have this issue of, you know, multiple environments probably. So you have a development environment, you have an integration environment, a QA environment and a prod environment, or maybe a pre-prod and whatever. Like, and there are always some slight differences um, between those environments. You, you know, usually you have those in, in the Kubernetes config maps. You have different values for backend services that have different URLs or maybe different settings. Uh, maybe you want to um, adjust the amount of replicas you want to use. You know, like in prod, you have four replicas, whereas in development, one replica of your microservice is enough. So you always have those slight subtle differences in your uh, Kubernetes deployment manifests, for example. Now, what you could do is like, you know, you can copy uh, the one file, you know, copy it and have it redundant, highly redundant, you know, in some uh, specific uh, directory. But that makes it kind of error prone and uh, well tedious to handle, especially in form of updates, because you have to kind of introduce the update in four different and distinct files. Now, you could say, well, I have a template for this one. But the same thing is here with templates, you know, slightly error prone. Now with customize, what you can do is it's a template free way to customize your application configuration. And I'll show you in a second. So the idea is basically that you have a, a base manifest and a base configuration, and then you use kind of an overlaying mechanism to overlay those environment specific values and configurations onto this base configuration. And that then makes um, the final um, configuration you, you apply to your environment. Now, Customize comes as a separate um, CLI, but luckily it's also been integrated into kubectl. So if you say kubectl apply minus K, then this basically um, uses um, Customize under the hood. Now let's have a quick look at what the Customize directory layout looks like. So we close this here. Where is my customize example? Right, so we do that here. We copy that one for later. Now here on the source, Kubernetes customize. Let's have a look what we have here. Well, the first thing, I have a base directory and I have overlays directory. In the overlays, you see, I have a def int and a prod environment just for demo purposes. Here in the base directory, we have this basic customization YAML. Now you see here, well, we swap a lot of YAML with, well, YAML again, but it's, it's not, that, um, not that bad. In this customization YAML, you can specify common labels, for example. You can specify the default namespace, um, a name suffix if you want. Then you have a list of 
Well, you know, basic resources, those are the base resources which we will merge with the specific resources later on. And you have, for example, a config, me a config map generator mechanism to kind of, you know, either automatically generate config maps from, you know, from files or from environment variable literals like this, for example. Now, if you have a look at those resources here for our microservice deployment, well, you see no templates whatsoever. It's just plain a plain Kubernetes deployment here in this case. And the service here, same here, is a plain service definition. No, no magic. Now in those overlay directories, again you see here, each and every overlay directory also contains a so-called customization YAML. Right? Again here you can specify common labels and the name prefix. Now here comes the important bit. You specify the basis for this customization and for this overlay. Now in our case here I reference um, well the base directory but you could also specify a git repository URL here where you kind of have a dedicated repository where all your you know basic um, deployment YAMLs are, are inside. And here you have a dedicated config map generator for example. And for prod, let's have a look at prod. You see here I have um, this section on patches strategic merge. So what I want here is uh, I want to, well, modify the original um, deployment in that case and I want to um, change the replica value and maybe I want to add, uh, you know, additional health checks. And this is what this overlay then looks like, okay? So on all I specify in here is, well, I only specify the liveness probe and the readiness probe for the container with a given name. And here, well, I only specify the replicas and all the rest of the deployment that comes, you know, from the um, um, from the base. Now, if we execute this now, so I could say, well, customize build, and then I specify the overlay directory. Well, maybe not use custom dev here. Well. We could use prod. Let's see what's not what's not working here. Oh wait, C customize that is overlays flash prod like this, and this command now will produce the final definitions. So you see, it's been generating this config map here, for example. Um, well, here's another config map, and what you see already here is that you know those those default labels and prod, for example, has have been inserted into you know every every definition. You see here, those are the services. Um, now we have here the deployments. This is the deployment for the database, and here's the deployment for our microservice, for example. And you see here, the replicas four has been inserted. Um, the liveness and the readiness probes have been inserted and this is what you then apply to the actual environment. So by using customize you can significantly reduce the amount of well redundant YAML descriptors if you have like complex environment setups and you usually have at least three environments right you have an int environment a dev environment uh, and a prod environment. Um, so definitely make sure to uh, to check out customize to kind of reduce this this YAML bloat you have to cope with otherwise. All right. Now let's have a quick look at scaffold. Now scaffold is what they say is like fast, repeatable, and simple local Kubernetes development, and that's definitely true. Uh, uh, trust me, I show you in a, I show you in a minute. Um, and what it does, it, it handles this complete workflow of, you know, building the Docker image from, you know, like uh, a source code artifacts or uh, maybe, um, you know, a, some binary artifact. It will push the image to some registry and then it will automatically deploy um, what you just built. 
and it does so by watching the local file system and it will continuously trigger this build and deploy workflow thing every time it detects any changes on the code. Okay, so you let this run in the background and what you can do is basically, uh, well, you know, sit in your IDE, code along, you know, issue the once in a while compile uh, command and then scaffold will take off it will, you know, build uh, the artifact, it will push it and deploy it. There's also a way to synchronize static resources without without even rebuilding the image. And it brings a lot of ton of support for different environments. It has something called profiles, environment variable templates, uh, cube context activation. Um, you know, it, it really um, empowers you to be really efficient and to get into this continuous workflow um, of building your applications. Now this is what the workflow kind of looks like in a nutshell, right? Um, it will detect the source code changes, then it will build the artifacts from a Docker file or using Bazel or maybe JIP if you have if you if you're in the Java world with Maven and Gradle. Uh, it does so locally. Uh, you can do in cluster builds using Canico um, or a Google Cloud build. So this is for building the artifact. Then you can test the artifacts for you know to that. If, if all the layers are correct. It provides different tagging strategies, like, you know, date time, git commit hash, um, or the SHA-256 hash. It will push the artifact, and then it will deploy the artifact either using kubectl, helm, or customize. So here, you already see a nice and neat integration between two of the tools. So you use scaffold for the continuous flow, and maybe you use customize um, to reduce the YAML bloat at the same time, right? So it is possible to kind of combine those tools nice and neatly to make you even more efficient and more productive. Okay, so time for a quick demo again. Um, so what do you need? First up, well, everything is defined in this central scaffold.yaml file, okay? Um, and you specify everything I showed you here. So here's the build section, for example. I specify the tagging policy. I specify what the image name is. Um, and I say, well, please use um, a local Docker installation, but please use BuildKit and not use the Docker CLI. I specify what to deploy. Okay, in this case, I use kubectl and specify two manifests. Um, and I give um, some details on port forwarding, um, so that I can automatically access and easily access the microservice I just deployed. Down here what you see is I have different profile sections as an example. Now the development um, profile is always automatically um, enabled if the current cube context is Docker desktop. So this is my, my, local, my local setup. You could, for example here, have, you know, maybe environment specific or environment variable based um, activation. So if I say, well, the, for the profile integration, it's always automatically activated if I have an environment variable called environment and it has the value int, and then maybe I use customize and I use the customize overlay to deploy this. Now, how do you run this? And this is real easy. So what you do now is we use this command and we go here in our console and we see scaffold def minus minus port forward minus p, well, which is, you know, I could um, manually specify uh, the profile. Well, we don't need that. And now look what it's doing, right? Um, so it's kind of going through all the stages. It's building the Docker image and, uh, well, now it's starting to deploy things. Now in the meantime, I will open a, a, a second console to show you the effect. Well, we let this continue to deploy. So microservice is deployed using port forward. So let's see if everything's working. And here we go, hello world, super done. Now I want to show you how this continuous deployment works. Um, well, we don't say, we say, Gradle, you kick ass. 
like that, which will basically throw away the old WAR file, build a new one, and once that's done, you see that um, scaffold at the top, you know, realized, okay, um, something changed, uh, I need to rebuild the image, and I need to trigger everything, build the image, and redeploy everything. And this is really neat, because you always have the latest binary deployed locally, so you're kind of in your developer flow. Um, you code along, you implement new features, you implement your unit tests, and once you're satisfied with the result, all you do is, well, um, you hit the build button, and Scaffold will from there on um, take off, and it saves you a lot of typing and makes it really nice, uh, nicely productive. Right. Now, the last and final bit I want to show you is a tool called T Tilt. They sell themselves stressless local Kubernetes development. And the idea of Tilt is pretty much the same as in Scaffold. Um, well, it will also, you know, uh, watch your file system changes, and once everything ch something changes, it will, you know, update uh, everything within seconds. What Tilt allows you a lot easy a lot easier is to fire up and manage complex microservice constellations. So this is where Tilt really shines. So if you have like, you know, a set of microservices, maybe one, two, three, um, that are, you know, tightly coupled, well, well, you shouldn't build those systems, but sometimes that's reality. And maybe you need a, you know, you need a database and something else, then Tilt makes it really easy to fire up this whole microservice constellation um, uh, quite neatly. Uh, well, it streams the logs and the events nicely. And what is r even more uh, nice is that it provides a nice console-based head-up display and a nice web UI, so you always uh, see what, what's actually happening and what is actually deployed. Okay, so time for a quick tilt demo. Well, well the central file, which is, uh, is the so-called tilt file, and you see here, this file is actually not YAML. Um, I've forgotten the name of this um, of the syntax, but it's kind of a Python dialect, a Starlark, I think it's called. And, but basically, it has the same elements as you've seen with custom uh, with scaffold before. So here, if you have the the Docker build section, here I um, specify a Kubernetes YAML using customize, which it should apply. Okay, so it also um, nightly integrates with cust customize. Um, I can specify Kubernetes resources, like a port forward in this case, and I could specify additional local resources um, that it should take care of. So I see the, the definition in this tilt file is, is totally reduced to the minimum um, to fire things up. Again, you have to install tilt, but that's really easy. And well, all we need to do in the console is say tilt up. So let's see if that's working. Now we go back to our console. Um, we kill this one here. And in this directory, we now say tilt up. So you see, it's basically doing pretty much the same thing as scaffold did before. This is the the web-based UI for for Tilt, and we're up and running again. Now, uh, if we go back to the console, well, you kind of have this, you know, this this console thing here, kind of kind of nice. And well, to just show you, well, the the idea is if we now say. Uh, The same thing, the same command as before, um, you see at the top that it again started the deployment again. So the concept is pretty much the same. Um, okay. Now I showed you quite a few tools that all aim to, well, improve your cloud-native developer productivity, right? Um, scaffold and Tilt, really useful in, you know, having this continuous flow of development. 
customize, super valuable to reduce the YAML bloat and cloud native build packs, which also integrates nicely with scaffold, for example. Um, well, this kind of gives you the, the, the possibility to um, build your final uh, runtime images using a standardized um, workflow and standardized build process. Now make sure to check out these tools because if you do so, I would say your cloud native DevX is so bright, uh, you need shades uh, when you sit in front of your computer. Okay, that was it for this session. Um, thanks for listening and I'm open for questions now. <laughs>